Hi, everyone. I'm Stacey Roseman, and this is Dr. Richard Cohen, my husband. We're really excited to be here with you today. This is going to be an amazing show. There's so much information and so many people that are suffering with different types of phobias, from agoraphobia to PTSD to um, uh, OCD to um, depression, because it's a extension of what happens from these different kinds of disorders so we're going to be talking to you about holistic tools and remedies as well as the medical types of medicines that the doctors put you on um for this type of condition so i'm going to that, let stacy that's where we write it everything <laughs> it is prevalent in our population i'm going to fact... try to just get my face in here so let yeah. me get closer to you i'd okay. love you i'd love you to be closer to me stacy now okay. in terms of it's very these anxiety disorders and concomitants of anxiety disorders it's important under important to understand that the prevalence in the united states are three million cases a year so this is a highly uh um um utilize service from uh that uh doctors have to treat uh these anxiety disorders as stacy just said include obsessive compulsive disorders which 11 percent of the population have ocd and uh really bad ocd as we'll talk about just a second uh uh is worse than a psychosis and i'll explain why in a little while there's also phobic disorders where you have unrealistic fear, Stacy, and people, the most common kinds of phobias are phobias with little animals, insects, snakes, uh, food, if, well, if food, exactly. Eat, like eating and noise. Exactly. The, people get very affected by that. Also flying is a big phobia. And cars, and, PTSD. Exactly. Well, PTSD is, is not exactly a phobia, but it's, it's actually you to very big life catastrophic events, people get intrusive memories and nightmares. Second door, the second door, sorry, I, um, agoraphobia is like, which is what I've been dealing with off and on through the years that I had to learn to train myself through different holistic integrated medicine techniques because I don't love medicine. And yes, I have to take medicine at times. We all do at times, but this is so painful. Emotional pain can be so much more painful than physical pain. And I've had catastrophic injuries. I'm dealing with one right now. But there's techniques that you can use with Reiki, energy medicine, instead of taking the pain medicine to be able to deal with that and really kind of live almost a pain-free life. Emotional pain is so catastrophic. It's so, I mean, it's so devastating. You, would you, can you explain the well, difference? The emotion, emotional pain, as I've seen, uh, and I started to see this in med school when I started to treat patients, is so horrible. It's worse than physical pain. That's one of the reasons why I went into psychiatry, because I wanted to combine my scientific knowledge with being able to help people with this horrible emotional pain. Uh, and as you're talking about, there's, there's also... Uh, something called the old game for it was hypochondriasis stacy and now it's called somatization disorders where pain and anxiety are combined right people repress displace and convert anxiety these are defense mechanisms to areas of the body right and now i understand what you're saying a mind to body connection but a lot of people don't understand because medical terms can you be can you can you talk to us like we're like 15 year olds for this because I think a lot of people need that because this is not their when, special when thing. people are Thank in inner, oh sure Stacy now when people are in inner psychic conflict these are basic usually basic drives or they feel guilty over them these are called id versus ego conflicts they start to get anxiety sometimes with this anxiety they repress the anxiety which means they uh, are uh, make it go into the subconscious and they, into the body and then they displace it and convert it to areas of the body which and, creates a lot of pain and these are called they causes pain and something called somatization disorders there's also psychophysiological disorders 
Uh, what does that mean? That, that means that because people get so nervous inside that the anxiety goes to areas of the body and actually causes physical disease and symptoms. An example of this is irritable bowel syndrome, where people get horrible cramps. A, a lot of GI problems. Yeah. You know, the GI tract is very, exactly, they get constipation, diarrhea, cramping, abdominal pain, which people really suffer from. And then some people overeat because of the way they deal with things. And then there's other people that don't eat at all, like me. You're, you're, you're exactly right. People, uh, let, let, let me back up just a second and okay, let me great. cover a couple of things. We're talking about... First of all, we were calling, we were talking about just so everybody understands, and I'll back up. There's anxiety disorders, and which is very prevalent in the population. Uh, Three million new cases each year of anxiety disorders. And then anxiety disorders have concomitant anxiety disorders, such as obsessive compulsive disorders, phobias, mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorders, which used to be called anxiety disorders, and now they're Part, part of the trauma disorders, uh, and there's uh, also um, panic disorders. So, and these are very prevalent in the population. And then we're talking about somatization disorders where anxiety gets repressed, displaced, and converted to errors in the body. And then we're talking about psychophysiological disorders. And one of the big places you have psychophysiological disorders are the GI tract. It's important to understand that uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, such as it's, which is in the vagus nerve. Which yeah, is, we're going to have to explain this a little bit more in detail because these are huge and you really need to understand what this is and why it affects us in such a huge way. And it's so it's just it can be devastating. I mean, it just those times when I go through this, that all I want to do is bury myself in a hole or go under the blanket and just escape into a cocoon and do my Reiki. I'm a Reiki master amongst a lot of other alternative medicine methods. But I mean, I've been known after some surgeries that were so catastrophic and the pain going along with it, like from that brutal attack I had recently, that I would spend a month in bed doing energy work. Reiki, whatever you want to consider it. And yes, I would heal quickly, but your well, turn. The, well, this is really like Stacy's talking about. I've noticed uh, that uh, Stacy uses a lot of the alternate medicine techniques to treat anxiety disorders, which I think is great. It's important to understand mindfulness is a cognitive technique. And one of the ways meditation is very helpful with this. And Stacy knows a lot more about this than I do. And, and mindfulness techniques too. And then there's this product I've been talking about for a couple of years, ASEA, ATP. And this has been one of my hugest healers besides doing my energy work. We're just gonna share these with you just briefly and then we're gonna get into um, the medical part of it. I just want the doctor to be able to explain exactly why these things uh, have helped me so much. The ATP, will you please explain this to them? Well, it's important to understand that, um, first of all, that ATP uh, is the most efficient form of energy there is. It's, it's in, in, you, get, you get it in uh, aerobic exercise. Has anybody ever noticed that the first four minutes of of exercise is grueling. You feel you're never going to make it through that. But if you make it through after four minutes, yes, then you go into an automatic phase. And that's 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 the hexose monophosphate shunt cycle. The the Krebs cycle is what people go in with called oxidative phosphorylation. And what happens is you go through, and this is very the most efficient kind of energy there is. You create something like 37 ATPs going into ADPs, which uh, which is the most efficient form of energy, and you get into aerobic oxidation, which you feel like after four minutes, you feel like your body's autom in automatic. You're just running, and and you and you can go on forever. So and let me tell them what happened the other day. So I wasn't able to move my arm. It dislocated for the sixth time. It hit a nerve, 
this is an athlete, an athlete's injury, but it has um, an edema around it, which I have to wait three months for. But I wasn't able to lift my arm at all to the side, to the front or anything, except for about two inches. And it was really, really devastating to me because for the past four years, and this also has the trigger effect from the attack that I was, you know, I that was really, really brutal. Um, so I have been working really hard on that and I'm doing really well as far as trauma um, from that. But the thing is that I started, I said, let me start taking that AC again. That was what helped me when I was first injured from this incident and had to have this shoulder surgery because all my rotator cuff muscles were shredded and they had to put an Achilles tendon cadaver in my back in order to hold my arm in the socket. So it ended out that they think it's ripped, the Achilles tendon cadaver. Um, we're not sure yet, but the problem is I am having much problem moving me up my arm. But when I started taking the SIA, it's about a week at this point, even after the first five minutes, and I wasn't able to lift my arm at all but two inches. And I'm talking like this, okay? Like this. Oh, wait, let me see. I'm trying to give you so you can see like an angle. Where are we? Like this much. And that's the wrong arm, sorry. Okay. So let me use this hand because this is a hand that's fine, but you'll get an idea. So like this, and then to the side, like that. And that was it. I wasn't able to move it anymore. Five minutes later, after taking the ASEA, I was able to take my hand and climb all the way up the wall to the very top. I was like, I can't believe I actually this, it actually happened. I was on the phone with um, one of my doctors, my shoulder doctors, and with Richie, who knows everything about this, this was what he did his thesis on in medical college. So, I mean, I was like, I, I mean, I thought I was in the twilight zone because I couldn't move my, my arm at all. And then all of a sudden, I'm climbing up the wall with my arm, which is a beginning exercise for the shoulder, but I couldn't move it. And I climbed it up like it was nothing. And I was like, I looked at him and I said, Richie, I just climbed my arm all the way up the wall. Look what I did. And, and I did it again. And I did it again. And I've been doing it since then too. And it's been getting better and better every single day. The yeah. other product that I'm using that's helping me tremendously with the pain, because I have nerves in my shoulder, it became numb, completely numb. And the nerves, they were like dead or at the time, that's what it felt like. Everything in my shoulder was dead. So I started getting back uh, the regeneration and I started getting all these kinds of pains in my shoulder and under my scapula and my back and then started going down my my arm. And there's this product with LifeWave that I've been taking on and off too. These two products have been my savior. This one takes the pain away. It's a little, it looks like a band-aid, a little round band-aid. There's several spots or a couple spots that you cut them on for different purposes, for different reasons, but this one's for pain. Here, here's the camera. Sorry, you guys. Um, I'm on the computer with my circle light, so it's a little different today because everything was fixed up for us perfectly. From now on, all the podcasts are going to be perfect, and I'm really excited about that. So I put this on my shoulder. And three minutes later, the pain is completely gone. It's amazing. It's bizarre. I don't know, but it works and it makes me happy. So all day long, I want to know to register what's going on in my arm and it's getting better. What's becoming, what's waking up and firing and wiring again. And at nighttime, so I could sleep, I put this on and I sleep like a baby. And I don't take sleeping medicine. I guess I do melatonin which also helped out with the COVID. Exactly right. You know, I, as Stacy's talking, uh, she's like my hero because she's been through so much trauma and her positive attitude just amazes me how she stays positive and doesn't get down about all this. And it, I have right my and all, and, 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 Well, I, I don't see him that much. I just see a very positive attitude, which is, uh, which I really look up to and respect. And if I was through all this trauma that Stacy's been through, Sorry. I could not do anything like this. But anyway, we're going to get back 
to uh, anxiety disorders. Yes. And uh, the first anxiety disorder we'll talk about is obsessive compulsive disorders. As I told you before, really bad OCD is worse than a psychosis. I remember I treated, treated a physician about 20 years ago. What who, is psychosis? I mean, I know what it is. Well, I, I, what is psychosis. A psychosis is where somebody's out of contact with reality. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. have hallucinations, delusions, ideas of reference. They think people are talking about them. It's exactly. That, By code, through codes. That, that's, that actually happens. And these are that's part of a paranoid delusion that they feel people are talking about them, which leads to ideas of reference. And when they go outside, people are staring at them, looking at them. And they're, they're not even, they're out of contact with reality. These, they're dealing with unreality where somebody who has anxiety disorder is uh, dealing with reality the, all the time. They're just they're just suffering themselves. They don't make other people suffer in contrast to a personality disorder. Right. People with personality disorders are they're not suffering from that because they have a longstanding maladaptive way of dealing with the world with intense, unstable interpersonal relationships. And they make other people suffer. They don't suffer themselves. So people with anxiety disorders are suffering a lot. They have inner, inner psychic conflict. As we talked before, these are id versus superego conflict. What does that mean? That well, means it versus is, it, super ego. It, it is your basic drives and the superego is guilt. And they feel guilty over their basic drives. People, uh, people, uh, any feeling, thought, or dream that comes into your head, you have to be able to accept with equanimity, calmness. But if people feel guilty over their thoughts, therefore, this leads to neurotic conflict and anxiety disorders. You should not feel guilty about your thoughts. Yeah. You should feel guilty about your actions. You control your actions. You can't control your thoughts. They come up from the subconscious mind. But we can change our thoughts through like DBT, dialect yeah. behavioral therapy. That, that's exactly right. D dialect. And DBT. You're, Stacey, you're exactly right. Uh, DBT has actually been very helpful. It's a it's a form of. Uh, I love it. It's a it's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy that took a bit. We started to work in the in the early 80s with DBT, and it helps extremely suicidal patients. Dialectic and, behavioral therapy. It's amazing. It's one of my favorites. I've taken it a couple of times, and I've taken it again. And and now, right, it's very helpful with, with personality disorders, especially the borderline personality disorders. It tends to really, people with borderline personality disorders use the defense mechanism of splitting. They split uh, themselves, situations, and other people uh, into black and white, and they can't. Oh, we got questions. Go ahead, talk. They, I'll try they, let me read. they can't. They can't see shades of gray. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, and therefore they can't modulate their affect. Everything comes through impulsively for these people. So. Dialectic DBT really is very helpful dealing with the borderline personality disorder. And EMDR. Be, 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 exactly. Before this, uh, it was uh, it was very, very um, difficult to treat the borderline because you had to make the person uncomfortable with their problems. Right. Because they're very comfortable with them. And so, therefore, it, it's, it was, it, it was, it, the saying is they were ego- sent platonic to their problems to treat whereas an anxiety disorder mm -hmm. the ego dystonic they're mm -hmm. uncomfortable mm -hmm. and they're easier to treat the borderline personality disorders and other personality disorders <laughs> is very comfortable with the problems. we are non-judgmental at all okay listen everybody's got something especially with the way the world is today there's so much going on so we're just trying to give information and trying to help okay so you know you have options and you can if you need any help all you have to do is send an email to stacy roseman 7 or stacy roseman 2 it's on this page right here at gmail.com and we will get back to you so so you're you know 
that you're exactly right. A good therapist is 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 non-judgmental. They're they're genuine and they're empathetic and they, compassionate. They they, they, they don't uh or else there any book knowledge you have mm -hmm. maybe 10 percent of being a good therapist you have to really be able to have empathy be non-judgmental accept accept other people for where they're at everybody has issues as stacy just said uh i have issues everybody has them <laughs> and to to really uh not uh to not not judge other people is the way to really be able to be a, a good therapist. Now we're going to get back to we were we were talking about uh, a very common anxiety disorder that's called obsessive compulsive disorder. It's it's endogenous in the population. What does endogenous 11, mean? That means eleven percent of people in the population have a form of obsessive compulsive disorder. I was talked about. Stacy asked me what psychosis is, and we got diverted. I, I, I told you that really bad obsessive compulsive disorders are worse than psychosis. Is. I treated a physician about 20 years ago. It took him four and a half hours to get dressed in the morning, so he couldn't function as a doctor because he couldn't even get out of the house. He put on clothes, put, put them, everything had to be perfect. And, uh, and so, the obsessions are the thoughts, mm -hmm. the compulsions are the actions that you can't control. Right. And they're like common forms of compulsions are hand washing. Mm -hmm. You feel the thoughts of, I, I feel so guilty about things, I better wash my hands a hundred times a day. So you're washing off the if guilt, it's not a thing about being dirt, feeling dirty? It, it can be, but usually it's a, the form of you're obsessed with feelings of guilt, dirtiness, and therefore, I'm going to make it clean. You're going to wash it away. And and, and they can't. And and, a, and it's, it's, they're they're so uh, they have these uh, rituals they have to go through. Mm -hmm. I better not step on this. A typical thing is an old wives' tale. Mm -hmm. I better not step on this crack, right? Because it'll break my mother's back, and that's called magical thinking. I better not step here Very or though something bad will happen. Mm -hmm. So therefore, patients tell me, I, I, just in case I don't want to do this, although there's no connection between mm -hmm. the two, stepping on a crack and their mother's back being broken, right. they don't step on the crack. Right. So what happens is that uh, and the, the, these behaviors become reinforced and reinforced. And in treatment, you try to, uh, you try to make people uh feel uh break these rituals mm -hmm. patterns they're having and uh there's also because it's endogenous part of these obsessive compulsive disorders mm -hmm. are biochemical and medications have been shown to be very helpful you know back in the 80s when i was treating people with obsessive compulsive disorder stacy yes. it was just amazing that there was no drugs in the United States and people had it so bad really? that uh that uh anaphronil, which is a breakdown product of topranil, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, was very helpful, but people couldn't get it in the United States. The FDA wouldn't approve it till 1991. Wow. So my patients in the 80s used to go to Canada, they were suffering so much to get it. Mm -hmm. Now there's a new medicine which is uh, an SSRI called Luvox. It's a newer medicine, and that's very helpful for obsessive compulsive disorders. So besides cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, this is this is shown to be very helpful. Now it's important to understand, I, I feel so much uh, empathy for people that having this. I even wrote a song about it, but I'm not going to sing the song. I'm going to give you the poem for the song. Okay, wait a second. Like. First of all, anxiety can also cause sleep disorders. Yes. We can't sing anything because this is a very special video just for this one video. So Richie is going, the, the song that he wrote, he's going to read as a poem. This is not copywritten. This is Richie's words. He wrote this. Okay. Rumination was her occupation. Maybe you can look a little bit this way just so they can see your face. Well, you don't have to look at the light because you have a problem I, with your eye. Well, I'm so wrapped. You want to, okay, you want to look at me? I want to look at you. I'm so wrapped okay, by your you. beauty. So, 
And so rumination was her occupation, indecisive, like a ship lost in sea, engaging in excessive procrastination. She can't see the forest from the trees. She gets preoccupied in details, yet never getting anywhere. But she's over conscientious and scrupulous, and deep inside, she really cares. Back and forth, up and back down, like a seesaw in flight. Mm -hmm. She's always losing track in time mm -hmm. because empathy and anger, they don't shine. Mm -hmm. Rubination was her occupation, indecisive like a ship lost at sea, engaging in excessive procrastination. She can't see the forest from the trees. Thanks. No, she can't see the forest from the trees. So as we're talking there, these people get so preoccupied in details mm -hmm. and they don't get anywhere, but they really try so hard and they're very conscientious mm -hmm. and they can't get empathy and anger to come together. Does that make sense to you, Stacy? Yes, it does. Uh, and so, except for that's something that I've been working on and I've been working with changing the pathways in my brain for changing the thoughts from negative to positive for so long. So you, you taught me this, you told me this, you know, about the empathy and the hurt, like the, you know, the hurt and the anger and bringing these both together. So I worked on them, um, for about two weeks, just briefly, you know, at brief times. And I was able to do it almost immediately because I've been able to train my brain over the years, how to do changing your thoughts, which is like the DBT and the CBT, that type of thing. But I have been working with it daily and through the energy medicine meditation of changing my thoughts, working with my soul and what's going on by through reflection, what's really going on in my mind, who I am, what my truth is, etc. And it's imperative in order to do these things that you need to know who you are and you must do the work. It's not that easy, but it's not that hard. And is it worth it? Absolutely. If you want to feel good and you want to heal, you do the work. It's not that hard. It's a lot harder going to the gym and building up your body than it is to do this type of thing. But you must be committed. You must be committed for your body, which is extremely important in healing too. Our health is physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental. You know, Stacey, you couldn't have said it any better. That's fantastic. And as you Thank were you. talking, you know, as you were talking about empathy and anger, yes. Uh, what happens is it's it's really helpful to be a able to hear with the obsessive compulsive disorder, they feel a lot of anger towards somebody and then they get guilt, feel guilty about it. Then they feel so guilty that they start to feel empathy for the other person. And then they go back and forth and then they feel so, uh, uh, so guilty that mm -hmm. they can't handle that and the anger returns. So they go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And one of the parts in therapy- Which creates so much panic because I've experienced this many, many times until I was able to learn how to do this. And it just creates such panic attacks, you know, because you, you start to hyperventilate, you can't breathe, your emotions are all over the place. You don't know what you're feeling and it gets very confusing. So to learn how to bring these two together is really amazing. It's an amazing, amazing technique. And this is something that we teach, right? That's exactly right. So we're heading to these people with obsessive compulsive disorders. It's really important to understand. They bind anxiety from feeling too much love or too much hate. And in binding that anxiety, it goes towards obsessive compulsive symptoms, the obsessive thoughts and the compulsive ritual actions. Right. Which causes all these GI problems. Well, actually anxiety causes right. GI problems. Oh, right. okay. And the obsessive compulsive symptoms are uh, and stress are rituals that people have to get through that these people are fighting two battles of the world. The bat this battle inside their head, which is all these symptoms, mm -hmm. and then the battle of the realistic world, 
people without anxiety disorders are free to just the battle of the realistic world is hard enough but these people are like an army on two fronts and i'd like for you to see them like that they're fighting the battle of the realistic world and this battle inside their head right and i understand that because i never had that before i mean i was a free bird i traveled around the world with my modeling my acting and i didn't have a second thought i was a free bird i felt safe and you know i wasn't nervous i'd eat alone i'd be in paris or wherever i was and i would be fine eating alone and traveling alone it'd be so much fun but once you get into our situation happens you have to work through this this is no joke you have to do the work you must do trauma therapy to get over this because it will ruin your life. You know, it's Stacy's passion is to really do social good, to help other people. And this is a really big goal. And it's such it's it's such a pleasure to see Stacy as just really even the light of all the trauma she's been through to really She's my hero to try to help other people. And she thank you. And like you're my just, hero too. And well, it was, Okay, whatever. It wasn't for you. I wouldn't be here today because 15 years ago we were talking about my book yeah. in our conversation when we yeah. were out to lunch. And we were talking about the book that I was writing, Empowered by Adversity. And you said to me, what are you afraid to be um, successful? And I said, no. And that's when I decided to write the book. I decided to go into this business. And now I have a podcast and I have courses and everything. And this is all because of Richie. Well, and now he's my husband. Well, that's really, <laughs> I'm partner. I, I want to be Stacey's partner, but as I'm talking now, I'm so raptured by her beauty. I was gonna oh, come share, on, please. I, I was gonna share like a poem, like a song I wrote about, but I'm gonna just You're not share, allowed. I'm just gonna no, no, I'm not no, playing the song. No, I'm just not gonna, today. I'm just gonna do the poem. If I could paint a picture. Features so tastefully framed, of eyes so warm and appealing. Naughty innocence was her name. The atmosphere that surrounds her, creating magic all its own, breathtaking and beguiling, and a voice so melodic and tone. Risque, yet so innocent. Naughty, yet so nice. <laughs> Contrast, so appealing. Naughty innocence, how you entice. Always so ravishly dressed, hair shining in moonlight. Thank you. Subtle yet so sexy, but always presenting so right. With a walk so graceful and wonderful, causing all heads to turn, she will always haunt me, the woman for who I yearn. Risque yet so innocent, naughty yet so nice. Contrast so appealing, naughty innocence. I'm sorry to divert my, but she's been distracting me with her beauty the whole evening. Oh, while Richie, I'm here. stop it! You know it's not about. This is not what this is about. But anyway, we're going to get back. I know it's, it's important the words of the song, but I, yeah, talking about me, that's not what's important. But, but you, what's I important was, is helping other I, people. I was, I was so distracted by how you really try. The purpose of, your, of these uh, forums right now are to get information out to help other people. Yes. And that's your real big goal in life. And yes, it, it is. warms me how beautiful you are on the inside. Really Thank you. Beautiful. That means a lot to me. So anyway, we're talking about anxiety disorders. And now we're going to talk about the phobias. The phobias are very concomitant in our population. Uh, where it's, it's where you have unrealistic fears. Uh, typical fears, as we talked about before, insects, flying, and... A very common phobia right now is agrophobia. I did some of the ritual research, Stacy, on agrophobia back. Wow, I'm not I'm listening. I'm I, reading. I, I did some of the ritual research with Dr. Joseph Wolpe, right. who's really the father, son, and Holy Ghost of behavior modification. He taught back at, at Temple Medical School back in the 70s. Uh, I remember he came from South Africa. It was a very analytically oriented medical school mm. uh, before he got there. And uh, all the analysts ran for the hills when Dr. Wolke came. Uh, him and Dr. Skinner, who was- I know who them, they are because, you know, I've been studying this for so long. When you told me that you were working with him, I was like, oh my God, because, well, you're my hero in so many ways. 
and he's my hero and Dr. Joe's my hero. I mean, there's not, there's not that many heroes that I have, but the ones that are, are huge. Well, you're going to give me a swell head, Stacey. I'm not anybody's hero, but it's important to understand that agoraphobia is a fear of fear, a fear of having panic attacks and people have avoidance behavior. The word agora is the marketplace. Mm -hmm. People had fears of going into the marketplace and their havens of safety become right. so uh, uh, minimal that mm -hmm. people sometimes can't even get out of their room. And through... I know, I've experienced that. Through behavior modification with systematic desensitization and flooding in vivo and in vitro... Which means... Um, there is a 90% success rate for treating agoraphobic. So you need I'm to gonna, explain what in vitro and the other one I'm going to explain everything. Thank We're you. We're talking about systematic desensitization. Right. And what that means is people, you have people go over a hierarchy of fears. And what makes them most scared? And maybe it's being in a crowded shopping center would be a hundred in mm -hmm. panic and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you work them through that in your office, having them feel calmness in the event, putting them into a mindful state, breathing in through their nose, out through their mouth, having all their muscles, progressive muscle relaxation, relax, and they're in a very calm state. And you have them managing that, feeling these relaxation in your office as they're imagining the event. And it's just so important to understand that as they start to feel calmness in imagining something that's a hundred, mm -hmm. being in a very uh, crowded shopping center, mm -hmm. they're able to feel calmness in there. And there, there's a bell-shaped curve for panic. And it goes like this and like that. And it maybe takes 20 minutes to get to the bottom of the bell-shaped curve. So if you can get them feeling calmness in this event, in, right. in vitro, in your office, they start to feel better. Then you take them to the horrible event in vivo, which means actually they experience it. Like in a mall. And they want to leave. And you get them to relax there, try to stay. And if you can actually, most people go to a mall, and if they have a panic disorder with agoraphobia, they leave and it gets reinforced. Right. The fears and the anxiety. If you can get them to the bottom of the bell shaped curve yeah. and make them feel calmness in the event, then they feel so much better. So, uh, so this is actually important to understand that they feel calm in this event and then it gets reinforced the calmness and this is the behavior modification, and it's that much easier to go in this situation. And the more you repeat it, the calmer they feel. Can I give an and example? That's why we get, sure. Okay, so the other day, ever since I was car jacked, um, I would get in my car right away, and I would um, make sure it was locked immediately. I, was, I would be scared to death. I was scared to death in my own shadow for a couple of years. It's happened. It's going to be four years on Halloween. And I was scared to death in my own shadow. I didn't want to go out. Um, I what did become secondary agoraphobic. I didn't want to leave my bedroom. I did have a traumatic brain injury. I was stuttering. I did get rid of that fast. I can't say why um, because you're not allowed to do that. But I do believe it was the ATP that had helped me with that. And also with the pain and healing from nine surgeries that I had to have after that. But I found that I went downstairs the other day and I couldn't drive right now. I was waiting for my friend to pick me up because of my shoulder. You're not allowed to drive under these conditions. Now I am because I can lift it more. As long as I'm at 10 and 4, I'm allowed to drive. So my girlfriend picked me up, but I was waiting for her. She was a little bit late. And I was sitting in the car in the passenger seat with the door open. This was the first time since the attack that I didn't run in the car and lock the door. I was actually able to sit in the car with the door open and be comfortable. Be comfortable enough and happy, you know, and not feel that fear. This was huge. This was such, I mean, I'm in trauma therapy. Right now I'm slowing down a little bit, but I was in trauma therapy three days a week. And um, 
I slowed it down to one day a week right now because I'm doing really, really good. And it was just such a huge, remarkable experience. I was so excited. I started crying and I called Richie and I said, I cannot believe this. I'm actually sitting in the car with the door open. That, that must have been so tremendously gratifying because what, what you're talking about, you, you actually, for yourself, you desensitized yourself to a very traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And as you do that more and more, it becomes easier and easier to go out. Well, I'm not going to, no, no, no. I mean, I'll do that here. I feel safe where I am here. I will not do that at other places. Safety, and I would tell everybody else, you get in your car, lock the door. Especially like in Florida, we're the third largest state in the country for um, abduction and servicing happening. Um, and I'm grateful that I'm alive because I had to jump out of my car at 50 miles an hour to save my life and nine operations later, but I am celebrating my life and I'm doing whatever I can to help other people. That's really very gratifying. So anybody else who needs some, some support and some, um, some questions answered, how, how am I do, how did I do this? How am I doing it? Just get in touch with me and we'll talk about it and we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Stacy's really, you know, she's very willing to help. She really wants to help. I've seen her go out of her way to help people that she hardly knows and are suffering a lot. Of course. And she's very, very supportive of, of these people. And, and she gets a, a lot of gratification out of helping people through tremendous psychological pain. And it's... That's what her, I don't think alcohol wants That's it. That's it, okay. That's it. That's what you want to drink it. Thank you. It doesn't drink alcohol. <laughs> Well, actually, I haven't drank alcohol since, uh, since uh, a fraternity party at Penn back, in, lost back, in, back at the 60s. And I got so sick uh, and I didn't I, uh, from uh, from drinking alcohol that night at, at uh, that party at Phi Sig yeah. that I lost my match against Harvard the next day. And I didn't do that well in an organic chemistry exam. And I thought to myself, why did I drink? I don't even like the taste of that stuff. <laughs> so I haven't had a drink since. So, uh, yeah, but you're always happy. It's all those endorphins working out six to eight hours a day, 77 years old. He works out six to eight hours a day. It's crazy. And he's about like 22 year old. So there's some kind of special genes going on in here or a lot of information that you have to share with all of us on how this well, is possible. Well, you know, if you can find things you like to do and they're healthy when you get a little bit older and I'm 77, do them every day. Uh, I was, uh, I don't have that much time because I want to spend more time with Stacy, but I was running a 10 K every day. And you're day. still working. And I'm still working about 60 to 70 hours a week. Yeah. And, uh, I, I hit tennis balls every day and I, uh, run 10 K and, and ride the and, bike and, for two hours and, and stretch for an hour. And I don't well, know because I'm sad to sleep by the time he gets in bed at night, I'm sad to sleep for hours already. I'm getting ready to wake up and do my meditation at four or five o'clock in the morning and he's getting ready to go to sleep. So, I anyway. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm I'm uh real I, I We're working on it. I, I we're not two ships passing in the night. <laughs> no, we're definitely not two ships passing in the night. Uh, uh as well, the thing is I do a lot of I do a lot of uh, forensic psychiatry and I have a lot of medical records to read in the evening. And uh and I try to get through that because I've got to prepare for my testimony the next day. Yes. So, so, but anyway, let me get back to what we're here for talking about anxiety disorder. Yes. And uh, it's important to understand that, uh, that uh, we talked about uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. Then we talked about panic disorders right. where people get rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath. And it gets so severe that they, some of them wind up in the emergency room. They think they're having a heart attack. Uh -huh. And it's very, okay. very scary for them. Uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're like, uh, and they wind up in the emergency room thinking in, they have a heart attack. And then they get fearful mm -hmm. and they have avoidance behavior. Now, mm -hmm. so we just talked, and we talked about the, tr the treatment for it. The best treatment, as I told you, is cognitive behavioral therapy with systematic desensitization, as I described it in vivo and in mm -hmm. vitro. 
there's a 90% success rate. And then also it's been shown that an SSRI Paxil and high dose PRN Xanax is very helpful in treating uh, panic disorders with agoraphobia. So that, that's the treatment. And now we're going to talk about- The only hard thing is finding a really great psychiatrist, just like in any doctor, orthopedic surgeon, which I'm dealing with right now. And I have so many orthopedic surgeons and the ones that have been working on me on my shoulder, but because of this injury, it's so hard to find an amazing doctor. So if you get a referral from somebody that they've had a great experience, run and see if they're in your health, your health plan. Um, that's, uh, you couldn't have said it better. And, uh, uh, you know, interview the psychiatrist, get the feeling that if he's empathetic, that means that he could put him, put himself in your shoes. He's mm -hmm. genuine. Mm -hmm. Is really being himself and is not playing a role, uh, and is non-judgmental, as we talked about before. You want really a therapist that is they're they're genuine. They're 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 not playing a role, and that's part of self-actualization. It's important to understand that. So that's tell part, everyone what self-actualization means. Well, it means like. There's, there's a hierarchy of needs. Maslow talked about, yes. about this. And basic needs are shelter, food, and then the higher level of needs where people sublimate, try to do social good, and also feel like they feel comfortable enough about their own skin that they don't have to put on airs for other people, that they're mm -hmm. genuine, that they're, a real, that they're a real person, that they're not playing a role. Right. And so, therefore, it's the exact opposite. A podcast before we talked about pseudo mutuality mm -hmm. and, and narcissism. Well, that was that the one before. No, that was the one before. <laughs> okay. But pseudo mutuality means uh, that uh, that you're that you're just trying to be play a role and being us uh, uh, not feeling comfortable with yourself, but having to portray yourself in a certain way for other people. So you could feel better about yourself. So other people will see you in that way. So we're as, getting into as, the thing like true as, happiness opposed to like people try to, you know, they'll go out and buy houses and cars for happiness to make them happy, but it's only temporary when real happiness comes from the inside. So you have to be able to develop those things inside of you. And that has to be taught because People have no idea what that really means. I, I wrote this poem about pseudo mutuality, and I'm just going to divert a little bit forward just to maybe this Help is a story people understand. About, so you can understand. Smooth on the outside, real on the inside. She's the society's dichotomy. Smiles for all, no matter what she feels. This part does not appeal to me. Her glitter, her walk, her clothes, her talk her pseudo-mutuality, impressing those with superficial eyes. This isn't what you should be. Superficial woman, you can't lose, but you can't win. Running around in circles, avoiding pain and spread to thin. The vulnerable, awkward, timid you, your sentimentality, your shy, self-conscious glance brings out the tenderness in me. Smooth on the outside, real on the inside. Your society's economy smiles for all, no matter what you feel. Yep. This part does not appeal to me. No, this part does not appeal to me. So we talked about pseudo mutuality there. This girl is trying to just be, has she has all the clothes, all the jewelry, everything, but yet she's, She's not comfortable with her own skin. And she's so this, not happy. Is, this is the opposite of somebody that's self-actualized. And I think it's really important that as you get your basic needs met, to head towards self-actualization where you One can sublimate best... your goals and do social good for other people. I find that it was super important. And I didn't have much of a choice anyway because I had to spend so much time healing in bed, reflecting on my life finding out who I truly am, what my purpose is, what's really important to me, what's my truth, who am I, 
what is my real truth down to the depth of the core of my soul. And that's what I still do. I do soul work when I do my energy medicine every single day. This is extremely important to live your truth and to be self-actualized, to be happy. You're never going to find real true happiness by keep on buying things. True happiness comes from the inside and self-actualization. You know, you couldn't have said it better, Stacey. That's wonderful. Uh, and and uh, so therefore we're talking about uh, a third, we were as we were diverting and we wanted to find a therapist who was genuine, who was uh, comfortable enough with their own skin that they are genuine and may be self-actualized, maybe who's non-judgmental. And of course. And if you could find these traits and, and has empathy for you and put yourself in, in, your, in their shoes. So this is important to be able to find and do. Now, as we're talking here, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, we've already talked about uh, somatization disorders, which is the old, the new term for hypochondriasis. We talked about uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. I'm going to tell you one of the things that keeps coming up in here in the questions is, people getting addicted to medicine. I've been fortunate enough that I don't know how I never got addicted to medicine, especially opiates. I can't wait to stop taking them. But, and the doctors were shocked that I didn't have to go into the hospital to get off the opiates after all those years of all those surgery, surgeries after surgery. But one of the things that we're talking about, or I hear often is getting addicted to benzos. Well, that's a huge problem. And it's important to take you know, people need to take, for treating anxiety disorders, there's, in besides the psychotherapy we've been talking about, which is usually cognitive behavioral therapy uh, and uh, ab reaction ventilatory tricyclotherapy, which we're going to talk about in just a second, mm -hmm. which will help post-traumatic stress disorders, is medications. And although I try to do psychotherapy and even though I'm a physician mm. and avoid medicines, they're indicated because a lot of these anxiety disorders are endogenous and biochemical, meaning you need medications to help. Uh, the uh, drugs such as SSRIs, uh, which is very important to understand, uh, uh, which is Paxil, Zoloft, uh, uh, and uh, you use them to uh, help with anxiety disorders. They're non-addicting. Really bad anxiety is disorders. Is that like the Boost Bar? Boost Bar is, uh, is, is, uh, is a buterophenone, and it's different than the SSRIs. Right. And it's a non-addictive form of anxiety, but it causes people. Uh, Look, I've taken that, um, but I have side effects from that. I, it's not addicting, but I get shocks in my body and I get super dizzy. I don't get, like, I'll take a benzo and I don't get dizzy. I'll re, I feel relaxed. My stomach is relaxed and I can eat. When my, when I have my PTSD and it's acting up, I can't eat and I can lose weight real, real fast. I have a fast metabolism and it's not good. So I have to make sure that I, I get those drinks or whatever it is to get my nutrients because I don't want to burn out my adrenal glands and other problems that you can cause major problems in your body if you're not getting the nutrients. And that's another whole area we will go over. You know, it's really, it's really exciting to see that you're so open, Stacy, and be able to discuss your own. A lot of people have, everybody has issues, and it's really nice that you can really discuss your own conflicts and anxiety, which everybody ha they has, so people can feel more comfortable with their own anxiety. Sure, but the other thing is too, I had a, I, I didn't know this for years, and most people don't know this. I had a, um, what's it called, the, the, the uh, DNA, oh, DNA test done on me 10 years ago. I had a DNA test done, they swabbed my mouth, and within four days, they were able to tell what medicines my body could break down and what medicines my body could not break down because medicines were making me so sick. I'm extremely sensitive to medication and it was making me so sick that I would put myself in the hospital for a couple of days 
just to get myself off the medicine and, you know, have the doctors take me off the medicine and try to meet, re-medicate me. And it would happen again and again. So eventually they gave me the DNA test. They took me off of almost all the medicines because my body cannot break down any of the medicines, maybe one well butrin, which I do have a GI problem if I take that because it gives you a lot of energy, which I have already. Um, but with depression, you lose that. Uh, and also because it makes you not hungry, which is good if you want to lose weight. And it makes you also want to stop smoking, which is really good. And it does not affect you sexually. A lot of these drugs affect, affect you sexually um, by numbing your organs. And I don't know how that works for well, you. He's very great. The SSRIs, which are <clears throat> very comfortable. My patients don't want to take it for Two reasons, mainly it causes weight gain and it has sexual side effects. Uh, and so, the, but it's been very helpful. And we're talking about, so we talked about alternatives to the benzodiazepines, which can be highly addicting. There are the SSRIs, uh, there's uh, um, there's the atypical. What so, about these beta? Let me talk about that in two. After, okay. Gonna, Sorry, I'm so excited well, about all this. I want to give you guys all this information. I'm sorry. There's so much that I have learned and that Richie knows that I want to be able to help you guys as much as I possibly can. And okay, go ahead. So what there what there is is um there's beta blockers as Stacy just talked about, like propanolol, and they actually cause the heart not to beat as deeply and as as the as fast this and is it, not what michael jackson took and it, it, it that yeah, killed him this yeah. is not and i ate dinner at michael jackson's house that was one of my i think that's my claim to fame having dinner at michael jackson's house and spending the evening there by some of the actresses and the producers yes stacy just tells me i'm just stacy's had such an interesting life i'm just so intrigued with all the great things Stacy experiences she's had. I feel uh, very fortunate. Uh, and uh, that was a life ago though. It's it's wonderful that Stacy got to experience all these wonderful things. And now that my purpose and my passion is this helping you. Everything that I had to learn, I took a negative experience and made it into a positive experience. You know, yeah. you know, you really when you talk about that, it's important to understand that good things can come from adversity. Mm -hmm. And it's very and and when you can really overcome some hard times, you can really have good things to come out of that. And you could use your experience to really want to teach other people what you've been through. And it makes the next time something happens, it makes it that much easier. Uh, that that's that's really excellent. So uh, that you can actually ex have experienced some tough times mm -hmm. and overcome them. And been that emotionally and mentally tough to be able right. to do that, this. Right, that mental toughness that you develop. Yes. And knowing you, that you've got over the last thing gives you the empowerment to get over the next thing. Exactly. So that that's really you know wonderful to see that Stacy had, and now she's using it for social good, which I I look and respect so much. Now we're talking about. Uh, medications and so now we're we, we already talked about the the benzodiazepines they're wonderful but they're highly addicting and people have to just take them prn when you feel anxiety Tell them what prn he means. means as needed uh and it's important to understand that they're able to do this okay. and not so the ssris as we talked okay. about paxil zoloft uh lexapro uh they're non-addictive, and they but they have sexual side effects. They have weight gain, uh, and then uh, it's also important to understand that there's um, um, atypicals, and these are like Abilify, uh, and they can be used where when there's uh, when there's anx uh, the anxiety disorder becomes so severe, and they there's horrible side effects to this and you have to be very careful such as tardive dyskinesia very severe weight gain and so you have to or um um so these are uh, other medications that could be used that's uh, why i like this the, dna test the, and if anybody wants to know the name of the company just get in touch with me 
That's that's I recommend that people do get this DNA test because Stacy Roseman seven at gmail.com or Stacy Roseman two at gmail.com. And that's wonderful that you can make this recommendation because I'm I wholly endorse this. Now there's also uh, besides the tr- uh, SSRIs and the atypicals, there's also tricycles that can be used, which are tolprenil. Yes, Elevil, sorry, and they, they can be very helpful to people. Uh, and uh, uh, so when you got close to me just then, I lost the uh, <laughs> turn of thought. And, you're so uh, funny, uh, you're very distracted. I'm getting blocks on the and that they uh, not, not the camera, but the thing here, right? They got the live the time, and then I got you, but he keeps going back and forth. So I want to just be in the picture a little bit. <laughs> but, you're, but you're very distracting, Stacey. Sorry. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, so we talked about medication management, and, she, and Stacey mentioned Fusebol, which is a non-addictive alternative medicine. It does have a lot of side effects. So now let's go on, and we've talked about obsessive compulsive disorders, the phobias, agoraphobias, I'm uh, just going to mention quickly here the, the, the somatization disorders, the psychophysiological disorders. We talked about little kids have separation anxiety disorders where they can't separate usually. Abandonment? From their, the, they, well, or is they, that they, later they, on? That's later on. People mm-hmm. do with borderline personality disorders. As we mentioned briefly, mm-hmm. people have feel very empty inside and they have fears of abandonment. And that's uh, that's one of the reasons why they see the world, the situations themselves, other people as black and white. And if I, they come into my office, these people, and they see me as all wonderful the first session, and then the next, because I'm all, and I tell them I'm not as wonderful as you think I am in this session, and they come in the next session, and they think, see me as all horrible. That's how you told me, you said you were more wonderful than then you were coming off you because you are wonderful, but you told me I'm more wonderful than I seem like I am. Well, <laughs> I I'm not sh- I, I'm not that wonderful and I'm yes, not so hard. I'm yes, somewhere in between okay, as with everybody else. Okay. Uh, and so that's important to understand. And so anyway, so uh what were what were so we went over the, all the anxiety disorders we talked about, and now We're going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, which used to be classified under anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. Now it's classified under trauma-related disorders, but it causes a lot of anxiety. People with a catastrophic, horrible event in their life usually have no preparatory anxiety to deal with this horrible event. Usually when something bad happens, sometimes people can prepare for it and have preparatory anxiety. People with post-traumatic stress disorders have no preparatory anxiety to deal with the horrible events. Mm -hmm. Hence, they deal with it after the fact, with nightmares, flashbacks, intrusive memories. I still have nightmares. And and it's it's horrible. And these nightmares can be really, really very devastating and debilitating. And they they have... uh, an easy startle response. Yes. They, and they triggers, start, triggers, and they, oh, they, triggers. The triggers come off <laughs> under little things, and and just uh, as the day goes on, a trigger can go back. It could be a song, or it could be a sound, or it could be too many people, or it could just be a loud noise, or you could be out and there's a lot of people around. It could be anything. It could be, I, I did say a song. It could be so many little things, or a touch in the wrong spot. If somebody touches you, in the wrong spot and that's where the trauma goes in your body because trauma picks a spot in your body like we talked about before like the gi tract or the back or there's different spots for different types of traumas so yes <laughs> so then you know, stacy can't be is she's so open about this and that's really so you see experience and you can be these people get feelings of detachment and derealization because of these events. and they this is that's exactly right very good stacy and they and they have all these symptoms and the treatment for this is usually the drug of choice is zoloft which is one of the SSRIs, plus ab reaction ventilatory psychotherapy mm-hmm. which means you have the person come into your office into a safe place and they ab react the event because they had no preparatory anxiety to deal with it and they mm-hmm. ab reacted after the fact which really is very helpful 
and it's the treatment of the, the psychotherapy treatment of choice for these post-traumatic stress disorders. And so that's really so that's really a really important to understand. Now it's important to understand that these people with anxiety disorders have a lot of losses in their life. And these losses and a pathological response mm-hmm. to loss is depression. So depression is a concomitant disorder to anxiety because people can't handle the losses they have. They, these people miss out on, people with anxiety disorders miss out on a lot in life. They, it affects utilizing applying information. It affects social functioning. It affects their concentration, persistence, and pace. Right. It affects their activities of daily living. And it, it affects their coping skills. So therefore, with all the losses they have in their life, they become depressed with problems with sleeping, appetite, energy, concentration. They get anhedonic, which means they have decreased ability to feel pleasure in life. They, uh, they start to have psychomotor agitation where they feel what very, does that, mean? that means that their body starts to go into overdrive. Right. And they, and they can't sit still. I've, I've experienced that before or talking or, a lot because you get nervous. Yeah, exactly. They, they have, that's called pressure of speech or else they go the other way and they have psychomotor retardation means they don't move very much at all. These people can get so down that they start to get suicide ideations and maybe even plans or intent. And these are, these is where, where my ears start to perk up right. because these can be psych, just like a heart attack for a cardiologist is an emergency. When somebody mentions the word suicide, it's an emergency for me. And I got to evaluate this and you, you got to look at various things. There's, you know, how rapidly the person re- regret, re- regresses under stress, mm-hmm. what kind of support systems they have. And you can really, if you can actually, and if they really have suicide potential, it's important to understand if you get them in a protective environment for two weeks, right. 98% of them are so thankful that they didn't try to kill themselves. So this is very important to understand. So we were talking about depression as a concomitant problem with anxiety. So this is this is also important to understand. Now, all these, we were talking about therapeutic techniques it's important to understand that alternate medicine techniques uh, are very, very helpful. Uh, and medicines such as, you know, uh, supplements such as GABA, which is gamma amino butyric acid, which is actually one of the uh, ways that the benzodiazepines work by increasing the level of gamma amino butyric acid in certain areas of the limbic system and brain. Uh, and that can be very helpful. Uh, and it's also important to understand mindfulness is really important. Mind, um, mindfulness is my specialty. There's so many different types of mindfulness activities. And this is my course for pre- the four pillars of healing. It's, but it's amazing. I mean, from happy dance therapy, movement therapy, to connecting with nature, to art therapy, um, there's the, there's, there's just so many, oh my God, there's the music therapy, there's, um, is it the walking in nature? There's the water therapy, the, the water movement therapy, there's the meditation. It, the list just goes on and on. So this will be one of the podcasts and we'll go through that then. So, you know, Stacy has been teaching me a lot about these alternate medicine techniques. And she's really Visualization like, is huge. Seeing yourself strong and healed. You know, visualization is really very, I work with a lot of athletes and visualization helps them in two areas. I work mm-hmm. with a lot of world-class tennis players and it really helps. Well, you are one. Well, I, that's it. Whatever, I'm, you don't like to uh, be. <laughs> I, I, he, is, uh, he has how many balls? 18, 17 or 18? I, I have 18 gold balls, which, gold are, balls. Sim- which are USTA, which are symbolic of a, of a United States national championships. Right, sure. and his daughter played Serena Williams, and the son. The both of them are what their top at hundred nationally. Well, Ju- Julia was Julia was top. She was a WTA pro. She played all four Grand Slams. Uh, proudly, both my kids were better than me. They were both all American tennis players in Division One college at the University of Miami. And so uh, kind to stay down to earth. Uh, and uh, uh, Josh coached the Philadelphia Freedoms. He. Uh, 
Uh, he has five wins over John Isner. Uh, I mean, he was number one junior in the United States. Julia was uh, got to the finals, the Australian Open juniors. She was mm-hmm. four in the world in juniors, 97 in the world uh, in women's tennis, has beaten four top 10 players in the world. Mm-hmm. Proudly, both my kids were so much better than I was. Uh, and uh, I'm so proud of both of them. Uh, I, I, I love tennis, but I was never on their level. Wow. Okay. Stacy just pointed out to me that we're running out of time, but I'm just going to summarize really quickly. We talked about all the anxiety disorders. We talked about treatment for these anxiety disorders. Uh, and, uh, we, uh, and we got into the alternative medicine for these, uh, our next podcast is going to uh, go off on some of one of the treatments we talked about, the wonderful use of ATP and uh, and how uh, it works with the mitochondria how- at the cellular level, cellular level, and it helps to reverse the aging process. So, you know, it's really, yeah, I got. I really enjoy doing these podcasts with you. It, <laughs> it really feels wonderful. And uh, I, I, uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to share them and be your business partner and do them with you. And thank you very much, Stacey. And thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming here and for sharing this with us. I'm really grateful. I want to help as many people as I can one day at a time, whatever it is. If you have any questions, please get in contact with me or with us and have a beautiful evening. Please like, comment, and share this video. Have a beautiful evening. Love us. We love you. Have a great night.